clears the approaches to Antwerp, the first Allied supply ship sails into the liberated harbor, a Canadian-built victory ship. Admiral Ramsey, Royal Navy, a Dutch admiral, and representatives of the United Nations Army and Naval Staffs welcome the Fort Cataraqui on arrival. The skipper receives congratulations as his ship ties up preparatory to the unloading of vital supplies for the armies on the Western Front. Salt, tar, and foodstuffs comprise the first load. Soon munitions, petrol, and vehicles will pour in to reinforce the advancing armies. With the opening of Antwerp Harbor, lines of communication are shortened by some hundred miles. Supplies may thus be brought in great quantity right to our front door. Thus is speeded the victorious ending to the final phase of the war. In Breda, Holland, there is jive and joviality for the lads with a late pass. Every evening, the Breda Palais de Danse is open for business. The Poles and Canadians of the 1st Canadian Army waste no time in improving international relationships with the fair Hollanders. Differences of language are no barrier to good fellowship because swing and schnapps are understood the world over. There are pretty hostesses and nobody to say, time gentlemen please, in the breed a night spot. There is a welcome sign on the door, so on your next leave, just come up and see us sometime. In the Low Countries, Royal Canadian Engineers construct giant Bailey bridges to carry the transport of our advancing army. Capable of supporting even the heaviest vehicles, the bridges replace those demolished by the enemy in his withdrawal to his own borders. A mighty engineering job, some 350 feet in length, the bridge is constructed in an incredibly short space of time. It is built of prefabricated parts which fit together like pieces of a Meccano set. Open for business, traffic flows across the vital link, carrying supplies and reinforcements. Whether it's a small footbridge across a stream or a mighty span across a broad river, the engineers deliver the job in quick time. Gunner officers of the Royal Canadian Artillery go to school with the RAF to qualify as pilots. On completion of training, they will handle the airborne eyes of artillery, the flying old pits. The ground training is much the same as elementary flying taught to regular Air Force pilots. Link trainers acquaint the embryo flyers with the controls. Morse code is mastered in the code room. Intelligence must be given to the ground by WT if RT reception is poor. The flying OOs must, therefore, be able to pound brass and recognize visual signals. An important part of the curriculum is aircraft recognition. The Oster planes used as air spotters are unarmed. When enemy aircraft looms up, it's a case of ducking for home, but quickly. The life of the pilot depends on his quick eye and his ability to recognize enemy aircraft at a glance. When preliminary classroom work is finished, the gunner officers get down to the real business of flying. Having learned the theory of flight, navigation, and how to fly on the ground, they are all ready for a hop. Accompanied by an instructor on the maiden flights, all tricks of the flying trade are taught the willing pupils. Taking off on a dime, they roar up to spot a target. Fire correctings are given until direct hits are made. Meanwhile, details of terrain, targets of opportunity, and any intelligence which might be of use to our troops are radioed back to ground. With flying, hunting targets, radioing corrections, and watching for enemy planes, a busy man is the Air OO. At Trail, B.C., a giant smelter, typical of Canada's war industries, hits peak production. 
75% of the United Nations output of lead, zinc, and tin, together with their byproducts, are produced by the great plant. With the war moving into another winter, the steady flow of essential supplies to the fighting front continues. Canadian workers back up their countrymen in arms with extra man hours and harder work. Into the smelters goes the pulverized ore to separate impurities and segregate byproducts. From its fiery interior, the finished product emerges. precipitates metals in huge baths. Ammonium nitrate is bagged, ready for shipment to many Dominion war plants. Other byproducts are dispatched to swell the output of factories in the USSR. Essential metals move to factories where they are translated into weapons of war. In turn, these are shipped to operational supply ports. There, great supply ships unload their cargoes from across the sea. dumps are replenished as quickly as they are used up by our advancing armies. Replenished by arms and equipment made in Canada by Canadian workmen for the use of the Allied armies as they drive into Germany for the knockout punch to the Hitler gang. General Eisenhower, on a tour of the 1st Canadian Army, arrives at the headquarters of Polish units under Canadian command. Accompanied by the Polish O.C., Major General Maciek and General Krierar, the Supreme Commander of the Western Theater gets first-hand views from his men by questioning them. leader, under whose command so many varied nationalities are welded together into a mighty striking force, is a welcome visitor at a Canadian bridging company. In the scheduled time of 15 minutes, a Bailey Bridge is constructed across a Dutch canal. Like a proud father, the Canadian GOC demonstrates all the phases of Canadian Army activity to the chief. The infantry and armor of a division which gave such a good account of itself at Cannes, the Valais Gap and the drive to Antwerp are inspected in detail. The terrible weapons of offense, the flame-throwing carriers give a fiery illustration of the way they carried the Albert Canal and other tough objectives. On the eve of the final great assault on strongholds of the Reich, General Eisenhower is confident of complete cooperation from the left of the line, the 1st Canadian Army. Thank you. 